Today, the Great Plains is traditionally seen as a great crop yielding area and it is the most productive dryland wheat area in the world. It is pivotal to the world grain supplies. However, for a pretty long time, it was traditionally seen as a desert, not fit for agriculture. So in this video, we're going to ask, what if the Great Plains was actually a desert? Early in the 19th century, the United States government sent out exploring expeditions. One of these was under the command of Lieutenant Zebulon Montgomery Pike, who in 1806 went west from St. Louis, Missouri to hunt the source of the Arkansas River. In this description of the country, he wrote, quote, from these immense prairies may arise one great advantage to the United States, the restriction of our population to some certain limits and thereby a continuation of the Union. Our citizens being so prone to rambling and extending themselves on the frontier will, through necessity, be constrained to limit their extent to the west of the borders of the Missouri and Mississippi, while they leave the prairies incapable of cultivation to the wandering and uncivilized aborigines of the country." End quote. The term Great American Desert was used in the 19th century to describe the western part of the Great Plains east of the Rocky Mountains in North America to about the 100th meridian. The term's usage can be traced back to the 1820 American Stephen H. Long scientific expedition which put the Great American Desert on the map. The area is now usually referred to as the High Plains and the original term is now sometimes used to describe the arid region of North America which includes parts of northwestern Mexico and the American Southwest. In colonial time, the terms quote-unquote desert was often used to describe treeless or uninhabited lands whether they were arid or not. But in the 19th century, the term had begun to take on its modern meaning. While the high plains are not a desert in the modern sense, in this older sense of the word, they were. The region is mostly semi-arid grassland and steppe. Today, much of the region supports agriculture through the use of aquifer water irrigation. But in the 19th century, the areas relative lack of water and wood made it seem unfit for farming and uninhabitable by an agriculturally based people. From the 1950s on, many areas of the Great Plains have become productive crop growing areas because of extensive irrigation on large land holdings. The United States is a major exporter of agricultural products. The southern portion of the Great Plains lies over the Ogala La Aquifer, a huge underground layer of water bearing strata. Also, the invention of the John Deere steel plow allowed settlers to rip up the tough turf that had littered the plains and allowed for the planting of crops. Let's say that in an alternate timeline, the great aquifer under the plains never existed. The great Ogallala aquifer is already being drained at an immense rate and may disappear for good. Already we have seen signs that the end of the great plains might be coming. The rural plains have lost a third of their population since 1920. Several hundred thousand square miles of the great plains have fewer than six inhabitants per square mile. The density standard that Frederick Jackson Turner used to declare the American frontier closed in 1893. Many of the areas of the Great Plains have fewer than two inhabitants per square mile. There are more than 6,000 ghost towns in Kansas alone. The continuing population loss has led some to suggest that the current use of the drier parts of the Great Plains is not sustainable. And there has been a proposal to return approximately 139,000 square miles of these drier parts to native prairie land. In this alternate timeline, without the aquifer, which supplies about 30% of the groundwater used for irrigation in the United States, the Great Plains would be abandoned to the Native Americas. Today, about 27% of the irrigated land in the entire United States lies over the aquifer. The region could still be used for resource extraction, but it could not produce the vast amounts of grain and corn as it does in our timeline. In this alternate timeline, the population of the world as a whole will be lower, as a vast swath of land will not be used for any agriculture or livestock rearing. European migration patterns would also be affected. European immigrants played an important role in settling the Great Plains. By 1910, foreign-born immigrants and their children constituted nearly half of the populations of the six northern plain states, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Nebraska, and Kansas, with the British, Germans, many of them from Russia, and the Scandinavians, the leading ethnic groups. The Prairie provinces were settled by British, German, Russians, including Mennonites, Ukrainians, and Scandinavians. Many millions of Europeans helped farm and develop the Great Plains. Without any agricultural capability in these lands, these millions of Europeans will likely pour instead into South America, especially the countries of Brazil and Argentina. In our actual timeline, from the end of the Napoleonic Wars until about 1920, some 60 million Europeans emigrated to the Americas and to other places. So of these 60 million Europeans, 71% went to North America and 21% went to Latin America, mostly Argentina and Brazil. About 11 million of these people went to Latin America, and these include 38% Italians, 28% Spaniards, and 11% Portuguese. With a much larger influx of Europeans 
into Argentina and Brazil in this alternate timeline, we could see the two powers becoming the economic giants of the Western Hemisphere, while America is hindered by a vast arid region right in the middle, cutting off the eastern and western parts of the country. Many people forget this, but Argentina was once the seventh wealthiest nation in the world. The massive wave of European immigration to Argentina, second only to the United States, led to a near reinvention of Argentine society and economy that by 1908 had placed the country as the seventh wealthiest developed nation in the world. Driven by the immigration wave and decrease in mortality, the Argentine population grew fivefold and the economy fifteenfold. So we would see many educated and pioneering immigrants arrive in Argentina and possibly raise it to the most powerful nation in the Western Hemisphere. The sphere of power would immediately shift downwards in the Western Hemisphere. However, in Argentina, power would rest in the hands of a few wealthy class of landowners having inherited a Spanish class system. Therefore, the nation would not be as powerful as the United States is in our timeline. Given a large Italian population, its sympathies would lie with Italy in the world wars. It would remain neutral since that would be the most economically viable strategy. With no America entering World War I as happened in our timeline, it's debatable whether or not the Entente or Central Powers will win, but I would rather save that for another video to explore in depth. Overall, the scenario shows that geography dictates the very nature and power of nations. Without optimal geography, nations cannot become superpowers like the United States today. Thanks for watching, make sure to subscribe for more great content. This is Scarlet the World, signing out.